Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today is abundance teacher and money coach, Jody Lynn Creighton. This is your daily dose of happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. And uh, this is an interesting thing. As, as we're starting today, I'm thinking about what's been going on in my day. And uh, Philip, who's joining us today as a guest, he was telling us what's been going on in his day. I, I didn't get a chance to find out from Jody Lynn. I have a sneaking suspicion just from the way she kind of answered a quick hello question. There's something going on in her day. There are days that come into our lives where we are challenged in a variety of different ways. And the challenge always really adds up to one thing. Stuff happens that we don't like. How are we going to respond? Interestingly enough, that ties in directly with what our guest is all about. Because he wrote a book called Disagree Without Disrespect. It, well, th that's like at the root of it, isn't it? It's not just disagreeing with others. It's also disagreeing with yourself, disagreeing with your experiences, disagreeing with what goes on in your life. So I, I, I kind of have the feeling, Jody Lynn, that what we've been experiencing in our lives ultimately becomes part of the topic today. Of course. Just because of who he is, right? Yeah. I mean, Doesn't it always? It, well, yeah, it does. You're right. Yeah, I, I should know better, right? <laughs> I mean, it always does. <laughs> So Philip Blackett, is it Blackett or Blackett? I wasn't sure. I, I should have asked. Yeah, Blackett's fine. Blackett. Okay. I, I, wouldn't, I want to get the pronunciation right. But uh, Philip, thank you, first of all, for joining us on the show. How are you doing today? I'm good. How you been? Uh, well, that's going to be part of what we talk about, I think. <laughs> are you feeling happy today? I, I'm just, well, every time that I do an episode of this podcast, I feel happy just because it's fun. And I get a big jolt of energy from it, as does everybody else. That's why we call it your daily dose of happy. There um, we go. But if you'd asked me that question an hour ago, I'm not sure what my answer would have been. <laughs> 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 I mean, you already know. You guys, you two already know. Audience doesn't know yet. One thing that was going on, which was there was a very big question about whether there was going to be a podcast episode at all today because my internet disappeared. It just like, boop, gone. And I got a little message from the internet provider saying, oh, it'll be back in an hour. Oh, it'll be back in two hours. Oh, it'll be back in six hours. Like, Whoa, okay. Oh, this is not going to work. But it came back sooner than that. There we go. Now, right on time. There were a couple of ways I could have responded to that, right? The way that I was first inclined to respond to it was, oh, crap. But I didn't do that. I have to give myself a pat on the back. I didn't actually do that. I said, well, if it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And then the sec next message I got was that was one that was going to be six hours. I said, well, okay, well, I guess that's gone. So I sent out emails to you guys, you know, well, it looks like it's going to be gone. I didn't, I didn't respond with, ah, I responded with, huh, well, you know, life goes on. And then two hours later, it came back just in time for us to do the show. Yep. That kind of ties into what you talk about, isn't it? Phil? Well, I, I look at it from the standpoint, I said, listen, you know, I'm trying to keep whatever black hairs I have left on both <laughs> top and on my face, right? Because yeah, clearly, <laughs> if I keep letting stress get the best of me, this is going to be all white after a while. Mm -hmm. And I haven't even touched 40. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I think how you respond to when life happens is absolutely a masterclass that all of us can learn from and review every now and then. <laughs> like every day. Yeah, <laughs> basically, it's a, it's a daily refresher, daily reminder. Hmm. Now you're making me remember when I was 40, because I was already graying. I mean, you see me now. There's no there, this used to be dark brown, believe it or not. <laughs> but there's none of that left. There's like a little tiny bit in the very back, and that's it. It's yeah. all gone. But it was it was already turning by the time I was 41. Actually, it was all it was turning by the time I was 25. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to be really really honest about it. And this this did not start at 39 where I'm at. It started before. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And, and I think kids might have something to do with it. Maybe genetics or a combination of the two. But I, I think what it is. Stress is the way to come because I don't have kids. So what's mm. my <laughs> I mean, I didn't ask you for your age, Walt, so I can't <laughs> get to that conclusion. Uh, I will do full disclosure. I turned 67 this month. There you go. But uh, the, the truth is that I was kind of, it's funny, I was, I was always told I, I look very young for my age. And that's always been true. Mm -hmm. But my hair always kind of gave it away. Like the face and the rest of me looked young and then there was the hair. And I, well, didn't, yeah. do, I didn't do the cosmetic thing. I didn't do you know the, the Grecian formula and all that kind of crap. You know, I said, well, okay, that's the way my hair is. 
But I also kind of said, what is my hair trying to tell me? It took me a long time to answer that question. It took me years to answer that question. What's the answer? Me. I was the one who was doing it. Mm. I was stressing. I was focusing on stuff I didn't like. I was focusing on results that didn't serve me. I, I was focusing on all the things that were not helping me, except they were helping me really well to stress. I was very good at that. Still am at times. <laughs> yep. We all are. <laughs> no, here I am. My white hair. <laughs> there you go. I, I will say this. I've been keeping facial hair ever since I could since 18 because my realization is the moment I take this away, I start looking like I'm back in high school again. <laughs> <laughs> I know I will get to a point where that will no longer matter. Um, but as of now, I'm keeping whatever whiskers I can I can keep for them. Okay, so so there's a balance, is what you're saying. It's like not too old, not too young. Mm -hmm. Well, my wife says she's digging the salt and pepper look, which when you're having like a few gray hairs and the rest is black, you can't really call that salt and pepper. But as I'm looking in reflection now, I think we're getting closer to that. So I'm like, mm -hmm. I think I'm getting to that stage. I think I'm getting excited now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reaction. You got excited about it. See, I started mm -hmm. to freak on it. Well, I didn't know the freak, but I started to get upset. Like, oh, this is not a good sign. You're, you're treating it like, hey, this is good stuff. Well, I, I'd rather take this in with excitement than the reality of going up and down the stairs and feeling knee pain already or yeah. getting injured while I sleep. It's like, oh, I slept wrong, and now my back is all out of sorts. And it's like a reminder of saying, you're getting old, Philip. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Embrace it because it's only going downhill from here for you. <laughs> yeah, I gotta stop this. No, no. I, like that, I am aging in reverse. I'm just getting younger and younger and younger. It was interesting. I had somebody say something to me. We were we were doing something, and they were like, "Oh yeah, my knees," or like whatever, right? And and I was like, "Oh yeah, whatever." And we were talking. And she was like, "Yeah, I started to feel old, like." in my body around like 37 and I'm going to be 39 this year. And I was like, am I supposed to feel old? And then the next day my what? knees hurt. Yeah. And I was like, no, I will <laughs> not. No, I'm not getting old. She this called into happened. existence, Walt. No, no. I'm just putting it out there into the universe that I do not age. I said, your wish is my command, Jody Lynn. That's right. <laughs> Well, that's really the key, isn't it? Catching it early. Because we all do this. Let's be perfectly honest with ourselves. Everybody does this at one time or another, usually of often in their lives. Yeah. The question isn't whether or not we do it. The question is, do we catch it and do we change it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you even believe that it's possible to change? Because there's some people out there that just think this is the way that it is. That was me. That was, that was me till like age 55. Yeah. I really did not believe I had any control over it. Yeah. You do. I'm scared the daylights out of me when I found out I did. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm serious because then I realized, oh no, I've been doing this to myself. I didn't even know it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was also yeah. encouraging. It was also empowering because then I realized, well, yeah, I've been doing this to myself all these years, but now I know I can reverse it. Now I'm not subject to it. Mm hmm. We I all have the gift on how we respond. We all have a choice to make. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So tell us, Philip, tell us about the book and how that came about. I mean, because I'm sure, first of all, I, I have to clue you in on something that I don't think is going to surprise you. We love stories. Stories are fun as far as we're concerned. And we want to know what the story is behind the Sure. Book. So tell us the story. So the book is called Disagree Without Disrespect, How to Respectfully Debate with Those Who Think, Believe, and Vote Differently from You. Ooh, I like how you added vote in there. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> of Especially course. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so the story behind it is it happened 4th of July last year. And my sister brought her family up to Boston to visit me and my family. And my mom came up to visit her children here and her grandchildren. So she was like, all in one, right? So the adults are in the living room. I'm talking to my sister about some topic, frankly, I don't remember anymore. All I know is, is that we were clearly on opposite sides of the issue. 
Um, and so as we started to discuss, some would say debate, I mean, tomato, tomato, um, my mom jumps in almost like a referee, but without the zebra shirt in the whistle. <laughs> she basically said, Lope, we're not going to do this. Um, I know we got fireworks planned for tonight. I have no intention of seeing fireworks happen in this living room right now. And so while I appreciate the intent she had as far as stepping in to try to preserve the peace, so to speak, so we could have a decent family get together. I think the impact of it was, quite frankly, a lost opportunity. And I think the lost opportunity was my sister and I, we don't see each other often. And so the times we do see each other, it means a lot more. And in this world of like social media and text messages and smartphones and all this stuff, some conversations are better had in person, face to face, rather than otherwise. Yeah. And so I think that was a lost opportunity for us to get to know each other better, as close as we are, brother and sister. And it was one of those things that made me reflect back and say, well, you know, if I experienced that, I wonder how many other people in this country, if not around the world, are probably having similar instances where there's something of value that means a lot to you that you want to share with somebody. And just because there's the possibility of disagreement, we don't even engage in that conversation altogether. And likely that's going to be something that impacts the quality of our relationships of which also impacts the level of happiness we have within those relationships. And so that's what led me to figure out, okay, how can we get to a point where we can have adult respectful conversations on things that people agree with and disagree with and still respect and love that person in a healthy relationship that keeps our happiness. And that's what led me to write out a five-step framework that I felt could help achieve that. And then later envelope that into the book, Disagree Without Disrespect, how to respectfully debate with those who think, believe, and vote differently from you. Wow. There are a number of things I like about that. But Jody Lane, I'm, I'm going to be curious to see what your take is on this. The one thing I like about that more than anything else is that you can't remember what the issue was between yourself and your sister. You remember everything else that was truly important about it, but the issue itself you, you forgot. It's like it, it had the lowest amount of importance. Mm -hmm. But we're, when we're in the midst of something like that, we give it the highest amount of importance. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It turns out it really isn't all that important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even if it went the other way where you did have like a big blow up, oftentimes people don't really know why they had that blow up, what the actual issue was. It was just the way that they felt coming out of that blow up, mm -hmm. whatever that was. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that this is such an important topic because, you know, in, in our pursuit of being kind and not rocking the boat, by not having these conversations, we've lot of, lost a lot of depth in our relationships and with the people that we surround ourselves with because now we're just terrified. Oh, I'm going to get tired with this brush of conspiracy theorist or, you know, whatever, right-wing nut, left-wing nut, whatever whatever it is. Like, it doesn't matter. There's there's all these examples. and mm -hmm. And then we tend to hide ourselves away and hide pieces of ourselves. And really that's not doing any sort of good for the world as a whole. And of course, at the same time, there's also the other part of us that's desperate to be right. It doesn't sure. even matter whether we're actually right. We have to be right. Yeah. <laughs> it's a given. If you're going to be in a conversation with somebody, particularly over something political or controversial, or whatever, you're right. That's why you took that position. <laughs> But I think what also comes in, in as well, Walt, too, is we also, for the most part, have a desire to be liked that as too. well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So sometimes those come in conflict as far as which one 
is going to win the day here? Is it more important for me to be right or more important for me to be liked by the other person <laughs> afterwards? Mm-hmm. And isn't it interesting how we often equate the two? Mm-hmm. You know, I, if, I, in order to be liked, I have to be right. Mm-hmm. If I'm not right, or, they're not, not going to like me. Or I, in order to be liked, we have to agree. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because another thing that's coming off more as a, a false myth to me is to love somebody is contingent on agreement. Mm. And the opposite end is to disagree with someone means you don't love that person. You know, it's even Not to the true. point. <laughs> right. So it's even to the point, like as a father of young daughters, you know, uh, something that commonly happens is you know, one of my daughters would do something that I didn't like and didn't agree with. And she will tell by my face and my tone of voice that I'm not pleased. And the most common question she asks is, Daddy, do you still love me? Mm -hmm. And of course, once you get yourself like, oh my gosh, now I'm a bad guy now, puppy eyes and all. Right. Uh, It's reiterating at the risk of over communicating with her that just because I disagree with you, same thing that my mom taught me, just because I disagree with you, that does not mean that I don't love you. And I think that's a message that was told to me and I'm trying to pass it on to my kids and hopefully they do the same for their kids. But I feel like it's missing in our society as well. Like that notion that you can still respect and love people, even if you don't see eye to eye on everything. So that kind of points to what I think of as the ultimate question, which is, can you appreciate someone you disagree with? Yep. Yep. Can well, you I appreciate think... their viewpoint, even if you don't like their viewpoint? Yep. Because if I was stranded on the road, injured, and somebody that completely disagrees with my whole philosophy comes over and calls the ambulance for me and makes sure that I'm tended to, while I'm by myself, I'm not caring about that person's political philosophy. I'll tell not you really. that. That's not your first priority. <laughs> and, <laughs> <the> top 20. <laughs> and if anything, once everything's resolved, that person's going to have a special place in my heart, mm-hmm. even if they continue to have a different philosophy mm-hmm. than I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This also points to what I think is really the heart, the root of this whole question. And it's a great question that Jody, Jody Lynn was pointing out because it's so uh, contemporaneous. It's so uh, appropriate for what goes on in society today, which is that we as human beings have a tendency, and I think I'm putting it mildly when I say this, but we have a tendency to want to look outside of ourselves when we don't like what's going on we don't really have a tendency to go inside and say, this is me disagreeing with myself. This is me disagreeing with who I am. Mm -hmm. We simply say, the other person's an idiot. The other person's crazy. The other person's too blank wing, whichever wing it is. The other person's too fill in the blank. In other words, it's the other person's fault. Mm -hmm. Very rarely are we willing to go and say, this is me. Isn't that interesting? Or the other thing I would say too, well, is it possible that I could be wrong? Oh God, no, we can't have that. Never. (laughs) (laughs) Or should I just double down until it's absolutely without a shadow of a doubt I'm wrong and now I look even worse? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. My dad used to say to me all the time, you want to be right or you want to be happy? Yeah. Mm. All right. Yeah. I know, I'm going to something else you said earlier, Jody Lynn, and, and actually something you said, Philip, you, you both hit on the same point. Um, it's amazing how we can reach not just a point in our life, we can experience long segments of our lives, because this is what I did. We can experience long segments of our lives where we really do believe we don't have any control over this. Mm-hmm. That what happens, happens. And we're just kind of like corks bobbing on the water and you know, 
oh, here comes a wave. Everybody duck. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing you can do. <laughs> Brace for it. Brace for it, right. Well, and how much um, like turmoil this topic, like being right, wanting to be right, like holding on to that and pushing everybody else away, how much turmoil it can create in your life and keep you stuck in feeling feelings of anger or blame or sadness or all of these things that you don't truly want to feel, but you're not really sure how to let go of because you want to be right. <laughs> <laughs> I remember um, I had a, a couple of really, really good girlfriends and um, like they were my best friends and I went through a really tough time in my life where, you know, I almost died and lost a baby and, all of these things happened and I told them what had happened and I had gotten a text message. Glad you're okay. And that was it. And then like a couple of weeks went by and I was, I was furious. I stewed on it for obviously those two weeks. Like seriously, you're my best friends and I almost died. And like, you didn't even call me to see if I was okay. Like lost a baby and like, they're both mothers. Um, and I was just so upset about it. And um, I remember like lashing out and texting them and being like, are you retarded? Like, what is wrong with you guys? <laughs> Seriously. And I mean, I, in hindsight, um, there were, there was probably other things going on and uh, like not knowing they're both younger than me and didn't really know, didn't really realize the severity of it, all of these things. But to make a really long story short, you know, I was stewing on this for years, for the last five years, but well, it was four years. It was last winter. I was driving with my dad and I said, you know, it still really bothers me because basically after that interaction, we just stopped talking. Went from being best friends to not communicating whatsoever. And I was really broken up about it. And uh, I'd had somebody reach out and say that they had talked to one of the girls and they were like, oh, yeah, you know, I feel bad about what happened here. and You know, whatever. And I'd love to rekindle that relationship again. And I was so bitter. And I realized in that moment when I was talking to my dad that I had this need to be right, the, 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 be right about that they were shitty friends, the, mm -hmm. the way that they acted was poor, that, you know, like I didn't deserve any of that, that they should have been there for me, all of these things that I was right about. And then as I was saying it out loud, I said, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. All of those things could be true. And then what? I'm right. They're wrong. Then what? Nothing. Nothing at all. Because even if they were to acknowledge that I was right and they were wrong and they were bad people at that moment in time, I wouldn't actually believe them or take their apology. So what am I looking for? And I, it was this moment of like just this weight lifted off my shoulders because I could see that I was stuck and I wanted this and I wanted it this way, mm -hmm. whatever it was. And it was keeping me in a place of, you know, holding on to me, even though I hadn't talked to them in three years, you know, it was still holding me and bothering me. And, you know, I felt all of these things. And in that moment, just that realization, like, do you want to be right? Or do you want to be happy? I want to be happy. It doesn't matter whether I believe I'm right or they do or whatever. It doesn't matter. I can let this go and I can move on. Wow. Yeah. You just played out in three acts exactly what we all go through yeah i mean seriously that that how often does that happen in all of our lives i, I can think of times that it's happened very recently in my life and yeah. i've had to literally stop myself and say well you realize what you're doing right <laughs> i mean let's take a step back here you do know what you're doing here right and there have actually been times i said yeah i know go away <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i just want to be mad about it let me do it i'm right I a lot of feelings <laughs> And so well, I, I actually do sometimes let myself feel it. But ultimately, I also get myself to the point of saying, all right, what's it going to take for you to let go of this? What's it going to mm -hmm. take? What's the price? Usually that's the, the, the 
question that does it. What's the price? Because the moment I have to pay a price, okay, I'm done. <laughs> I don't have to pay a price. Even though you've been paying a price, you just didn't realize the well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, once you put the P word to it, it's like, oh, ugh. okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, Phil, Philip, how do we have these conversations without disrespecting somebody? Yeah, so I think it plays out a lot of what you two have been talking about, where, you know, it's a simple five step framework I talk about in my book, where, you know, just take it one step at a time. You know, first one is, you know, separate the idea or belief from the identity of the believer. Whew. That is a powerful statement. It's like what you said about love. I might disagree with you, but I will always love you. It's challenging too. It's not easy to do all the time. No. Yeah. Like as a preface, this framework is simple, but it's not necessarily easy. Yeah. <laughs> right. So why is that a, a great first step is, you know, you can imagine like there's probably some beliefs, some ideas that become so intertwined with who a person is that it becomes who they are. And what often happens is to disagree with an idea or belief that way, that other person can take it differently. The other person could take it personally to the point where they get defensive. Maybe they build their walls up. Maybe they start to think that you don't like them. If I critique the idea now, it sounds like I'm criticizing or hating on them. Mm -hmm. And it makes it a much tougher conversation to have because already you're working behind yeah. uh, trying to get back to ground zero now. And so step two is, is kind of like we talked about before, where it's like you can disagree with the belief or idea and still respect and love the believer. So it's kind of mm -hmm. like what I talked about before, where it's like you can disagree with somebody and still love them. You know, yeah. when I went, when I went to church, it was the whole essence of, hating the sin, but love the sinner. That's how I got from it, where it's just like, okay, I can disagree. Two things can be true. I can love you. And I think that what you're saying doesn't vibe with me. And yet I can still love you. And I can say that your text message to me was not sufficient. Mm-hmm. I, I needed something more from my friend mm -hmm. and I'm just going to be honest with you. Cause I don't want to keep this inside and I don't want this to impact our friendship. I mean, keeping it inside and stewing over it at the risk of us having a conflict about this. Right. Yeah. Um, and so once you kind of set the groundwork there from those two previous steps, now you can go to the step three, which is ultimately what a debate should be about. You're talking about the issue at hand based on its merit. So what I'm talking about is you're talking about facts, logic, data, research, analysis, performance, reviews, results. You try to stay objective with what's going on with the issue at hand. I'm not getting involved with name calling because I, I did not have to live long enough as I've lived now to know once you get involved with name calling, any sort of debate you're going to have now, sensible debate, goes right out the window. <laughs> it's True. no longer a debate. You might as well just go ahead and press the reset button, grab your basketball, and go home. <laughs> Nothing good is going to come out of this at this point. But yet, we're enthralled by it because of the drama that comes from it oh, and yes. the entertainment value. Oh, yes. But, you know... If we can do that and focus on the issue at hand, like listen to the other person's point of view, genuinely, actively, ask questions to better understand that person's perspective, then you lead them to step four. Regardless of the outcome, whether it's me seeing Jody Lynn's point of view or vice versa, or us agreeing to disagree at the end of it, or something we weren't even expecting as a byproduct of the whole thing altogether, a third alternative. We should embody what we learned when we were playing sports when we were young. Like, what happened at the end of a game, win or lose, what did the teams do? Shake hands. There you go. Is that a good game? Like, 
good sportsmanship can still be modeled in our relationships and friendships where you can essentially say, listen, I appreciate us talking about this. I may still look at things differently. However, Walt, I never knew why that issue was so important to you until you shared it with me. I appreciate you taking the time to educate me and inform me where your perspective comes from. I didn't know that. And then that kind of leads into the final step. You can still respect and appreciate the person after the debate. If you disagree, that's fine. Chalk it up to us having an atmosphere that embraces diversity of thought. Yeah. But if anything else, you keep the door open, more importantly, to continue the dialogue, mm -hmm. to build the relationship after the debate, where you say, Jody Lynn, I appreciate what we talked about. I love for us to continue that conversation. Maybe there's an event coming up next week. Maybe we should attend it. See what that speaker has to say on this topic. And then we can come back again and see if anything changes or any questions come up that we can talk about openly over coffee afterwards. Mm -hmm. But in any case, you're keeping the relationship intact because you're believing that the relationship, as we talked about before, is more important than whether or not I'm right or, or wrong. Mm -hmm. I love that. A couple of thoughts came to my mind as you were going through those steps too. One was when you referred to uh, how what somebody else says may not vibe with you. When you said that, what instantly occurred to me was, yeah, there's so many different levels of vibration. There are literally as many different levels of vibration as there are people multiplied by 10. <laughs> because there's just an infinite number of different vibration levels. So if, when you think about it, it's, it's almost an amazing thing when you do vibrate to something that somebody else says, like, oh my God, you're at the same level right now? That's incredible. <laughs> That was the first thought that came to me. The second thought that came to me was, and you kind of alluded to it um, toward the end of your comments there, just because it vibes now doesn't mean it's going to vibe later. Or just because it doesn't vibe now doesn't mean that it can't vibe later. In other words, the vibration changes. Mm -hmm. Our vibrations change. Mm -hmm. It changed by the minute, <laughs> let alone by the day or by the week. Our oh, moods, yeah, the moods, yeah. Our moods can change yeah. throughout the day, yeah. and the other part of it is when you get new information. God yeah. forbid, you might lead to a new decision, yeah, a new thought pattern, a new way of thinking, a new experience, a new experience. Mm -hmm. Over fine. time, it could just be just time passing. Yeah, <laughs> you get you live life long enough. You get enough gray hairs after a while, you start seeing things differently than you did when you were 20. That's mm -hmm. true. Maybe you're more open this time versus before. A number of things can play a role here. Thank you for pointing out what the actual benefit to all those gray hairs are that I have. I, I, really <laughs> <appreciate> that. <laughs> I like to continue to equate gray hairs with wisdom, which is why my wife is insistent that I don't pluck any off my head. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 good, good approach. I like that. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. There's also something I, I am experimenting with, to be perfectly honest, and have been experimenting with for quite some time. Because we associate the gray hair with aging or with wisdom or, or something along that line. But we don't really seem to have any associations with gray reverting back to original color because, well, that never happens. And the thought that keeps going to my mind is, yeah, well, why doesn't it? Is it inevitable? Does, does hair always have to change one direction only? And when I frame it that way, I realize, not really. I mean, I don't know how it would work. I don't know what the mechanism would be. But it's not impossible. Nothing's impossible. It is possible somehow, in some way that I don't know about, for hair to change. Well, well we should it, probably... It, we we should probably ask uh, Mrs. Benjamin Button over here <laughs> for her thoughts on this one. <laughs> well, I, th I immediately think of um, when women go through pregnancy 
and like hair changes a whole bunch. Like I've had friends who their hair color completely changes. It went from like straight to curly and from curly to straight and all sorts of different things. And that's just really different hormones, I think, within the body that are, are doing those things. But I just went to the, the hairdresser the other day and she's like, wow, I don't remember your hair being this thick. And I was like, ding, ding, ding. Mm-hmm. My hair's changing. I don't know why. I don't know how, but it's changing because I'm I am reverse aging. Philip. <laughs> well, I mean, I, 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 was change. Well, a point. I, I was doing it for humor, but I was also raising it as a serious point because ultimately what this extremely challenging question is asking us is, are we willing to consider possibilities that we have previously ruled out as possible? Are we willing to open our minds enough to say, maybe there's something else I haven't thought of. Maybe there's something else I haven't considered. Maybe I don't have the whole picture. Mm -hmm. I think about something that I learned through a a class, a a course, uh, the boot camp that was offered by a good friend and former uh, co-host here on the show, David Strickland. Uh, And in that boot camp, they had us do a meditation. And this meditation was guided meditation. Uh, they, They basically had you start where you were on the earth, wherever town you're in, whatever house you're in, all that kind of thing. And then they would ima- have, have you imagine you're rising out of that house so you can see your town and then you can see your region and your country and you're going higher and higher and higher. You go out into space, you can see the planet and you're getting further and further away and the planet's getting smaller and smaller and you're seeing more and more of outer space. The, hi- the whole idea of the meditation was to take you out to a point where the earth disappeared. The sun was a, this little tiny speck and from that perspective, understand how important those problems and frustrations and limitations that you're tying yourself to, that you're hanging onto for dear life, you see just how important they really are. Because in the, in the giant space of things, it's like they're nothing. They're so infinitesimally small, it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And the thing I loved about that meditation is it gave me a perspective of there is no such thing as a limitation other than the one that I pick, other than the one that I select, that I hang on to, that I choose, that I grab onto and hang on to for dear life. And if I ever want to change any of those, all I gotta do is let go. Yeah. It's kind of humbling actually. <laughs> totally. Well, and, and maybe it begins with this conversation of having tough conversations, disagreeing, because if you're able to have a conversation and be open enough to listen to somebody else's point of view and maybe something perks, like that's interesting, you know, not for me, but interesting. Maybe next time it'd be, huh, that's interesting. I like that. I'm going to adopt that. Like it feels like by beginning this, you're really opening a door to possibilities like whether you're like yes i accept that possibility i'm going to take that with me and change my mind on my whole philosophy of life or maybe that's just a you know like an opening to the next turn or or whatever or being even just more open with people in general and to me the exciting part is when we recognize the power that that gives to us Mm-hmm. Just just the recognition of that ability to choose gives us a tremendous amount of power that if we were to ask ourselves before we had that recognition, just how much power there is there, we'd have said, what power? What are you talking about? But when you look at it closely, oh my God, the power is immense. Mm-hmm. It's incredible. Well, one of the ways I like to um, kind of point out to myself just how powerful the human mind is just how powerful we are as beings, is to pay attention to things that I hang on to like a bulldog. I mean, I'll get it between my teeth and I won't let go. And my focus, uh, there are often times I have trouble maintaining focus, not then, not when I'm hanging on for dear life to whatever that thing is I'm hanging on to. That's when I demonstrate to myself, my God, I have incredible mental power. I'm willing to hang on to this thing come hell or high water. I don't care. I'm hanging on to it. That that takes power. That takes Mm -hmm. strength to do that. 
and once I look at it that way, then I realize, wow, I guess maybe I am more powerful than I've been giving myself credit for. So I, if I do choose to make changes, if I do choose to look at things differently, if I do choose to think about things differently, if I actually dare to consider shifting an opinion about something, I could actually change my world. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's a scary concept, but it's all empowering at the same time. Mm -hmm. So what's been the uh, the reception of the book, Philip? I'm curious to know how are people receiving it? Because it's relatively, you put, this is recently published. I mean, you talked about the story, the inspiring it happening this past summer. So this is a really new publication. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think part of the reception is, is I think it, it's it been helpful for people to have something that's simple and more tangible, so to speak, as far as like, what can they start to work on, right? Because oftentimes when it comes to relationships, It'd be ideal if both people in the relationship adopt changes. But sometimes as simple as what Jody Lynn said is like, hmm, that's interesting. Tell me more. Something that's very simple is doing that that allows people to say, I didn't think you were going to ask me to tell you more, but sure, while you're at it, I'll go ahead and tell you more about it. <laughs> And so something as small as that, I find that it's been helpful for people to say, hey, you know what? Conversations with certain people aren't as tense as before. Like I've noticed that people are starting to be more comfortable, less defensive. The guards are coming down just from simple acts. You know, like one person told me, it's like, Philip, it's, like, it's not like you came up with the cure for cancer here. Like some of this stuff has been around for a while, but not maybe not organized in a way to say, hey, if you take this in sequence and just start small in little bits in your next conversations, you start to build reps. You start to get more practice and feel more comfortable doing things. Um, and people start to note that. And they say, hey, it's, it's so different talking to Walt compared to other people because he's just much easier to talk to. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I have to walk on eggshells around Jody Lynn when I talk to her because she's that much more like calm, cool, collected around me and just listens. Mm -hmm. And we could just have a, a go back and forth tennis match without her trying to outserve me every time. You know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah I, 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 that, that, been that, the outserving part, I, that one stuck with me just now. It, it, that, it, it's always a one-upmanship kind of thing, isn't it? Not always, but it's often a one-upmanship thing. Like, oh yeah, well, how about this? Well, you didn't you didn't consider this? Well, yeah, well, how about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To want to be right, <laughs> especially with politics. <laughs> be right yeah. or be dead. <laughs> That's right. Uh, it's so interesting because I didn't care about politics. I've told you this before, Walt, for mm -hmm. a really long time, probably until maybe 2020. I just, I, I'm Canadian. So I definitely didn't know what Democrat and Republican meant. And you live uh, in the US, you still haven't figured that out. So you're not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I, I don't know, but I really didn't know what liberal and conservative meant either or NDP. Like it just, I had no desire to learn. And then that was one of the things observing others as I began to learn and become interested on like how these things happen and what's going on, and what the rules are. And I don't know, whatever things that were going on that were of interest to me, you know, just seeing the, the division, the segregation of, you know, like this is, you know, this is right and this is wrong. And um, okay, like <laughs> maybe, maybe I got, I, I, I still, I don't know. There's things that I definitely lean towards, but me as a personality, I've always been curious. Like, tell me why, tell me why you think that that's, that's okay or that's good or like, whatever. And, and I'm always challenging myself to think uh, about other ways that I can perceive what's happening. And I'm just a naturally curious person. 
But um, there's a lot of division in our world because of that one topic of politics and so many others too. Um, but I think about, you know, if we could have conversation, actually it percolates in my mind at when, uh, when COVID was happening, um, there was the uh, like giant Black Lives Matter rallies and stuff that were going on. I think that was like right after George Floyd. And uh, my best friend, Anita, she put together uh, one of the things that she wants to do in her life is talk about racial diversity and teach people about that. And I think that's really cool. And we've always had this beautiful relationship where I've been able to ask the really dumb questions, which I'm really appreciative of, because if you don't ask, if you don't ask questions, how are you ever going to know? Right. Right. But I never felt comfortable. I mean, I grew up in a very, very, very small town, less than a thousand people. And we had one black person and that was it. And we weren't even in the same grade. So I didn't know him. And then they moved out shortly after that. That was my exposure to culture before I was, you know, 18. And so then my best friend that I become friends with, and then we become fast friends, and then we're the best friends, obviously. Um, she's she is black. And now I can ask some questions like, hey, like, what about this? And what about that? Like just things that I've always thought of that always felt maybe this is inappropriate to ask. And I've always appreciated that she didn't think I was dumb and that she treated me with respect and kindness in asking these questions. But we get onto this, this conversation and I don't even remember where I was going with this point, but she has this like event or whatever. It's all on zoom and everybody's there and there's a bunch of people there. And all I wanted to know was how people were feeling within their culture, within her family, within the United States, how is it different between Canada and the United States with everything that happened with Floyd? And, you know, like, I just wanted to hear people's opinion. And it was crazy because nobody talked. Nobody at all. Like, they, it was, everybody was afraid to say anything. Uh, and it was a mix of individuals, different races. And, um, Nobody except for Anita, like Anita was like trying to prompt people, like, tell us about your experience. Like, have you experienced racism? Like, you know, everybody just sat there like on their hands. <laughs> and I'm like, I was really excited to come and learn. And I don't know, just tell me <laughs> all the things, but it, nobody talked about it. It was so uncomfortable. Nope, not going to do it. Not going to do it, right? <laughs> well, like, you say we something. Yeah. Well, but I, I, I'm a little 38 year old white girl. Like I, I didn't feel like I could say anything that would bring value to the table. And maybe that was a problem. I don't know. But it was really interesting just watching the dynamic and how uncomfortable it felt and how nobody wanted to talk about it. Cause I, well, I was afraid to say something to, to upset somebody else, to offend somebody else or whatever. And I was really just there because I wanted to learn, mm -hmm. which is crazy. I, I, th I think that's one of the key things you said, Jody, Lynn. it's just like, you were there to learn. We're not having conversations nowadays where people go into it initially, primarily to learn from yeah. one another. Because I would argue that that Zoom room was a missed opportunity. Yes, because you had a lot of people that were feeling a certain type of way, but you were also preventing yourself to say something because what was also in tension with you and how you were feeling was you were concerned about I'm basically on a minefield. And I don't know if what I'm going to say is going to set somebody off, given the emotions in the room, whether seen visibly or not. Yeah, right. And what I don't want this to be is a number of people coming at me all of a sudden, even though it's on Zoom, it does feel like people are coming at me. Yeah. yeah. Right. And what happens there, I would argue, is how are you going to learn candidly what people are feeling? And it might be the sense that it may be perfectly fine to say, maybe we need a little time to come in between. Yeah, so people can simmer down a little bit. Yeah, maybe it was too close. <laughs> maybe it was too. Maybe it was too yeah. soon. Yeah, you know, and it's just like you, you're trying to do a real time, you know, look on things, and it might be like, hey, maybe we should take like 
a few days or maybe do small groups instead of it being like 20 people like i'm just gonna put you in a, a meeting room with just like two other people yeah maybe that that's not as daunting yeah but to your point when you're trying to go about it from learning you gotta provide a setting where people feel like they can take their guards down yeah and they feel comfortable that what they're going to share whether it sounds you know poignant and intellectual or sounds downright dumb to you <laughs> that it's okay because the person is being genuine and sharing what he or she is thinking or feeling mm -hmm. or trying to make sense of the whole matter but if you don't provide a setting for that people are going to keep that inside people mm -hmm. are going to go to their own eco chambers as far as people that will validate and confirm how they feel and then you're shocked when you come across somebody on the odd moment that doesn't the seedings the same way. Mm. And maybe you take it personal. It's like, I have to be right here. So I'm going to slam this person verbally, shame this person on social media, censor what he or she is saying so that I feel right. As opposed to seeing this as an opportunity. It's like, okay, they, they honestly feel this way. It's not, an intent to hurt me mm -hmm. it's different from how i feel but let's have a conversation about it yeah for me what you're talking about also brings up the importance of the appreciation piece that we were talking about earlier because if you're in a conversation or even a fledgling conversation that hasn't quite happened yet with people who you sense are appreciative, it's easier to open up. It's easier to feel safe in expressing yourself. Mm -hmm. When you feel like anything you say is going to be judged, probably not so much. <laughs> probably don't want to open the mouth. So this is where the appreciation piece really comes in in a big way in my mind, because whenever I can bring appreciation to an uncomfortable topic and uncomfortable conversation, I can be pretty confident that no matter what happens, it's going to play out more positively than it otherwise would have, simply because I brought the appreciation. Mm -hmm. and, and the interesting thing is I don't have to corral everybody else in the group to get them on the same team. No, let's all appreciate. I only have to do it myself. Mm -hmm. Just my own bit, my own little piece of appreciation has that ripple of that. Mm -hmm. So if I can find a way to appreciate, regardless of whether I like or dislike what I'm hearing, if I can find a way to appreciate anyway, that brings the barriers down a little bit. Yep. Yeah. So appreciation is pretty darn powerful. I agree. <laughs> and I think that these, uh, opposing opinions, differing opinions, whatever differing experiences add to the spice of life and make us better or have the potential to make us better as a, as humanity. Yep. Because I think part of it is, I you know you mentioned that diversity is you know important, it's cool and that's where I think one of the things that, you know, I try to help people understand is Diversity goes not just beneath the surface, but it goes beneath the skin, mm -hmm. beneath what you see on the outside. And oftentimes it's how people think. What yeah. do they believe in? What do they feel particularly moved to vote for? Yeah. That you can't see just by looking at a person. But the only way you can find out is provide a setting where they can share that with you. You know, diversity of thought to me is a whole nother level of diversity that's not on the same level of importance with some people as opposed to what you see on the outside. However, if we're going to have a society that's more open to people of different backgrounds and sorts, um, that should be part of that diversity conversation as well. Yeah. How can you appreciate somebody if you don't know what's going on beneath the skin level? Mm -hmm. I mean, you really can't. It's not possible. And yeah. on top of that as well, well, it's it's if, if you're going off based what you see, you're kind of going based on 
Lux. It's a pretty limited scope at that point. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. So all, I, I know all I need to know just by what I see, mm-hmm. even though we're so much more of a multidimensional human being for each of us. Which is really odd when I think about it, because, I mean, th- this is this ties into a conversation we've had a lot here on the show, which is uh, the difference between experiencing a conversation in person versus having a conversation like we are doing here on video, um, and then at the other extreme, the quasi conversations that happen in social media that are that calling them quasi conversations is probably generous because they really aren't conversational at all. But when you have the the, the more how do I want to say this the the more data that we get, the better we have an understanding of what's going on in the room, so to speak. So when we're in the same place with somebody, we get more data. We get, I mean, when we're doing it by video, we, we can hear each other, we can see each other. So we're getting those two pieces of information. But when we're in the same room, we can also feel something that's coming through. And well, to be honest, I feel stuff through the video as well. Yeah, but, I was going to challenge you there. Yeah, but, but <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? You get more yeah. when you're in person. there's there's more data there's more information that comes in i think we're more in tuned to being in person and in the same room and those skills so that you can have the same skills long distance i think we just need better practice at honing in on what those feelings might be but i get what you're saying yeah and that well you just said the word too the word that i was aiming at was feeling because the feelings that we pick up tell us a lot Mm -hmm. they tell us a lot about what we're thinking and what we're doing. And they also tell us quite a bit about what somebody else is thinking. We just have to be willing to tune into it. Mm-hmm. Those feelings, man, they can just, they speak volumes. <laughs> it's amazing how much information comes through <laughs> on those feelings. So when I think about the, this, uh, this topic that you raised in, in your book, Philip, um, the ability to disagree with, dis- without being disrespectful or, or to put it another way, to disagree respectfully. Uh, to find respectful ways to, to disagree with each other. I think about it in terms of what are the feelings that are coming through? Because there are going to be a ton of feelings. That's one thing you can count on. Wherever there's polarization, there are a bunch of feelings going on. Mm-hmm. Interest, isn't it interesting how often we skip those? Totally. Just, I mean, especially when two people are going at it, and particularly a political discussion or a political argument, let's put it that way. You got a political argument, two people just going at it head to head. It's almost like they're oblivious to this ream of information that's coming out for their feelings. Like, no, I'm not going to pay attention to that part at all. How do we do that? What, well, why do we do that? Why do we cut ourselves off from that? That's the first question. I, I honestly don't have an answer for that. one. Maybe you do, Philip. I don't know. I, I've not figured out. why. Do, Jody Lynn, do you know why we cut ourselves off from that? Why do we, why do we cut ourselves off from that flow? I think because it's, it, well, I think, well, I, what I would say is two things. Number one, we want to be right. So we can't, can't be open to your interpretation. Oh, okay. That might make too much sense. <laughs> and like number two, if you were to allow yourself to fully experience the whole picture, you mm-hmm. might forget what you were fighting about. Because that kind of takes over Um, or maybe you open a door to like, it's scary to feel all of those sensations all at once. Now it becomes real. It's not their opinion versus your opinion. It's this human being that you can feel, you can feel their anger, their pain, their sadness, whatever. And now it's all within you. That's a lot. So I think we block ourselves from it. Mm Mm-hmm. Good explanation. I think sometimes we get into a fight or flight mode in real time. Yeah. And so you're looking at this and say, how can I preserve myself first off? Mm -hmm. Um, Protect myself, especially if emotions are high and voices increase in volume. And so once again, we talked about name calling. Once that happens, the whole debate goes out the window. Yeah. When you're in a place where now all of a sudden things seem threatening you're more concerned about how do i get myself out of here yeah right <laughs> and, and and how do i defend myself you know which is colored or sprinkled with i want to be right here especially if i'm on a platform that i'm seen by others publicly and now there's an ego part of this as well where i don't want to admit to being wrong because now 
what will other people say in response? Yeah. So there's a number of things that are going on in real time, like you said, Jody Lynn, in, in tandem and multitude. Um, that for a lot of people, that could be a, a tall tale to truly navigate. This is going to sound weird, but this actually reminds me of a conversation that came that was played out in one of the Harry Potter movies. The three main characters, Harry, Hermione, and Ron, were in the same room. They're having this conversation, and Hermione is pointing out how uh, Cho, who, who has a, a fledgling little romance going with Harry, uh, has a whole bunch of things going on in her life. And she describes all the things going on in her life that could be causing conflict and making it difficult for her to relate with Harry and all that kind of thing. And Ron's response is, no one could feel all those things. They'd explode. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of wonder, is that kind of what's going on at the, you know, below the surface that we're, we're not tapping into the feelings going on because we feel like we'll, we'll explode if we do? Maybe. I mean, if, if you're feeling all of them in tandem, that's a lot of multitasking you're doing, mm. right? Sometimes you're just kind of picking and choosing this is the route I'm going on. Because if I'm if I'm arguing with you and in the back of my mind while I'm arguing with you, I'm also like, make sure you hit on this because the people are looking at you in a certain way. You want to make sure you're proceeding mm. the right way. And then so, oh, by the way, he's he's raising his fist at you, too. Do you have an, ex an escape route just in case if he starts charging at you? Mm. Like these are, I know we think thousands of thoughts a day i just wonder to your point well like if you can think all those thoughts at simultaneously in that type of situation can your brain actually just give out be like this is too much <laughs> well, it, can. it can i mean i think we've all experienced it at various times uh, probably the easiest one to to that almost anybody could relate to is the first time you fall in love you're feeling a whole mixture of i mean it's not just one Feeling. You're feeling a whole bunch of things all at once, and your brain can literally lock up. Like, you can't think of anything. You know, you, there's something you're supposed to say here, but you can't remember for the life of yourself what it is that you're going to say, mm -hmm. or what you're even supposed to say, or how you're supposed to handle the situation. Everything just goes blank. So, there's an example of And that's a simple one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's one of the easier ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which means this is a skill that really needs to be developed over time with a lot of self patience and self care because it takes it takes some doing to learn it mm -hmm. practice yeah and wisdom hairs exactly <laughs> wisdom hairs <laughs> that's right <laughs> oh i love it this has been fun this has been a good conversation I have to say, we, we, we love going down rabbit holes. This is one of my favorite rabbit holes this month. This has been a really, really good one. A um, couple things, though, that we need to touch on, though. Um, clearly, you're a man of depth. You've got a lot of stuff to say. Yeah, I'm sure you said a lot in your book. You've shared a lot of good stuff here. Uh, and you, you don't shy away from a conversation that might even lead to disagreement. So I have to ask the obvious question. Do you, do you welcome people reaching out to you? And if so, how do they find you? Sure, of course. Um, so, you know, my book, Disagree Without Disrespect, How to Respectfully Debate with Those Who Think, Believe, and Vote Differently from You, it's on Amazon, along with some of the other books I've written, of which I'm sure um, you're probably bound to find a book that you might disagree with me on. Um, all the more reason to go to Amazon and just look up my name, Philip Blackett, and see what you find and see if you agree or disagree. I'm welcome to either one. Um, you can also go to my website, philipblackett.com, spelled P-H-I-L-I-P-B-L-A-C-K-E-T-T. -T. And you can also look me up on social media. Same thing, just my name, Philip Blackett, Facebook, X slash Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, and um, I guess even TikTok too. But that's a whole nother story. But yeah, I'm definitely searchable. As Coach Prime would say in college football, I'm not hard to find. All right. All right. That's good. And it will also include a link to your website in the show notes too, to make it easy. Cause we like to make it easy for people. Awesome. So, okay. So that's the first thing. Second thing I have to do is I have to share something with you that I discovered a couple of years ago. And I made it a part of the show now since then, because I, I realized something that kind of had slipped through the cracks. You, like so many people who come onto the show, you you found something in your life. You, you, you experienced an event 
you told us a story. You, you experienced an event this past summer and you turned it into a book because you realized there was an important message in here that you didn't want to overlook and you wanted to share it with the world. And like everybody else who comes out of this program, you wanted to share it. And not only do you want to share it, you come onto a program like this. You, and I'm sure you have other outlets too, other podcasts that you do, you probably do social media, probably do a whole bunch of things. You just named, actually, we know you did. You named some, you TikTok, we, I mean, Facebook, X, Twitter, you named them, right? So we know that you're putting this, this, uh, this content out there. The thing that I notice is that we often don't credit, get credit for the stuff that we put out there that people absorb without us knowing about. So I always like to make it a point to say, on behalf of those people you've never met, Philip, and you've never seen, never will meet, never will see, who have been consuming your content, hearing what you have to say and benefiting from it, on their behalf, thank you for what you're doing, because you're making a difference in this world. I appreciate it. I think as somebody who's been that person who's read and subscribed but never said anything, maybe because you didn't have anything better to say, um, or you were afraid of being out there, publicly as far as having a like or a comment or a share to it. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. I think that oftentimes, you know, we do things because uh, we're hoping we're being of service to people, um, whether we know it or not from that person. So um, it helps us keep going each day, just knowing that we're positively, positively having an impact and good influence on people for what we're trying to do, which isn't always easy, but we no, appreciate it's not, but it's worthwhile. Absolutely. Definitely worthwhile. Now comes my favorite part of the program, Philip. This is where I turn to Jody Lynn because she's really, really good at this. I ask her, how do you tie all this together? What's your one theme that you want to leave us with to say, this is what it all tied together for me in this show? I always tee it up to just make me freak I, out I, a little I'm bit sure. on the inside. I'm really <laughs> sure that she's like, like massive amounts of pressure. On me. Okay, go. <laughs> Ah, I think something that we can agree on um, at, in society or as humanity, or I hope that we can agree on, is that we want to leave this world better than what we found. You know, we want to have a better place for ourselves and the future generations that come. And often we're taught that to do that, um, to get along, we need to agree. And this was a beautiful reminder that we can still have that love and that kindness and separate the idea from the individual and disagree with love. And I think that is what our world needs now more than ever with people feeling isolated and alone and, and just, you know, isolated in their own thoughts and their own ideas of we need to remind them that it's okay to have your own ideas and to share those own ideas and to look at others who don't share the same wisdom or thoughts as you do. And just getting to know those people will make our world a better place and make us better human beings. Good stuff. I love it. Philip Black, thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate you. And we wish you all the best with the book. And you know, just keep putting that message out there. It's such an important message. Thank you so much, Walt. Thank you, Jody Lynn. I appreciate it from each one of you, the opportunity to have this conversation with you. And thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.